True Story is a documentary podcast powered by the Institute of Documentary Film. You can find news from the world of film on all the common platforms such as iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, as well as on docweb.net. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the very first edition of the IDF Industry Sessions, Who is Who in the Documentary Industry 2020, a series of short panels organized by the Institute of Documentary Film in Prague. My name is Marion Schmidt, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Documentary Association of Europe. And before I introduce my great, my, I introduce my great guests, I would like to thank the IDF team, um, Hanna Kulhankova, Anna Ka Kaslova, Steniek Blaha, and their whole amazing great team for having me and for this renewed collaboration between the IDF and the Documentary Association of Europe. In this first session, we will introduce you to five representatives of leading documentary film sales companies in Europe that are ready to acquire documentary projects from Central and Eastern Europe. Welcome to the five of you. I will start by introducing you all very briefly, but then we go right into getting to know you a bit better. We have here with us today, Alexander Guvedarica, co-founder of Sindicato Film Sales, Alexandra Dervinenko, Sales and Acquisitions at Cats and Dogs, Peter Mitric, Acquisition Executive of Taskovsky Films, and last but not least, Stefan Klos, Managing Director of Rise and Shine World Sales. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for taking the time to be with us today and to share with you some in, share with us some insights into the world of sales that for many people is still a world of mysteries. Well, um, with much because we don't have that much time and we want to keep it short and sweet, I will jump right in and I would like to start by asking all of you to briefly um, tell us a little bit more about yourselves and maybe how you became sales agents or got to work in sales, but to also say a few words about your company's profile, the number and kind of films you take per year and what you are looking for. I think I start with Alexandra. Um, uh, hi, the floor hello. is yours. Hi, hello. I'm Alexandra Derevienko from Cat and Dogs, uh, Paris-based uh, sales agency. Um, uh, we are taking um, approximately 15 to 20 creative documentaries per year. Um, we are distributing films on uh, uh, festivals as well as we're taking care of uh, sales, um, kind of in a wide sense of it, meaning theatrical, te uh, television, um, in-flight uh, uh, or, or streaming. Um, we're taking care of festivals, as I mentioned, which is a very important part uh, of our work um, uh, in this case. And uh, how I get into the uh, into sales, well, it was, uh, to be short, I, I finished uh, um, school in Spain that uh, requires, um, uh, that requires uh, internship in one of the companies, regardless if it's production or sales agency. And I decided to go for sales agency. And here I am after 10 years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's great to hear that you, you got your first internship in a sales company and that made you stay there. I think we probably need more of these internship opportunities in sales companies because I know quite a few people that would be interested in understanding more and never quite know where to start. But maybe Stefan, you have been around for quite some time with, as a producer and a sales agent. Maybe you can t tell us a little bit about yourself and also how you got into this business and what, what you would tell people that would like to get into this business on how to do that best. With pleasure. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm also a producer. Um, I started as a producer. We've run, been running a production company for 20 years. 15 years ago, we started also selling films and from like selling our own films, it, it opened up to selling more films. And um, we said, okay, we either stop this here or we take it on a real level. So for 15 years, 
Um, we've been working with Rise and Shine World Sales, um, a very similar setup um, um, as we just uh, heard from, from, from Cat and Dogs. We're doing about 15 new films a year, um, taking them to all the markets, theatrical, non-theatrical, festival is a very, very strong threshold for us. Um, uh, my partner Anya is running the company with me, is like taking part uh, of festival screenings only, so permanently in touch with programmers and so on, booking the films into, into um, festivals. Um, the theatrical market, of course, VOD market, educational markets, you name it. Um, we basically, and that, that that brings me to like, how how did I get there, and why am I doing what am I doing? What I'm doing? It's 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 a bit like in the name of the company, rise and shine. Um, I, I just love to to fall in love with films that are outstanding and help to make them rise and shine. That's what we're trying to do as sales agents. Thank you very much. That's beautifully said. I would like, before I go to our next guest, um, both of you, you just said, both of you said, and we take care of festivals. What does this mean, taking care of festivals? Stefan, what does it mean in your work? You're taking care of festivals when you acquire a film. Mm, it means it's, it's a good question because we just take it for granted. Everybody knows why we're taking, taking care of care of festivals. Um, it basically means like when when do we get attached to a film? Sometimes at early stages, where when we like know the filmmaker and know the project from from international pitches or from just like you know talking to each other like. Um, give you an example, we, we, we had a premiere at Berlinale with Nelly and Nadine by Magnus Gerten. We represented his previous film, Every Face Has a Name. So from there on, it just like we knew about that new project very early. So it was a very natural thing. If it works, that you work well together, that you get involved early on in the next film. Sometimes it's later, um, like at a rough cut stage maybe, um, but definitely it should be in a stage where we're still able to help submitting the film to festivals or lobby for the film at festival programmers because um, I mean in the end the festival programmers and the selection committees decide of course but um, we're one of those who talk to the programmers a couple of times a year about new projects new films coming up so we're kind of like with the first selection committee in a, in a way kind of selecting those films that might have a very um, a strong resonance with an audience. So the programmers have a tendency to, to maybe like watch them with a little bit more attention and say, oh, we should definitely have a look at that. If they in the end select it or not, that's up to them. But we of course have a conversation there. So that's where it starts taking care, uh, when I say um, taking care of festivals. And then when the film has had the world premiere, but like booking it into more festivals, negotiating screening fees, or is the film in competition? What can we do? What can we do um, uh, so that the film shines in the best kind of way in the territory? Also taking into consideration premiere statuses. Is it a world premiere? Where can it go for international premiere? Should there be like a small festival in between? What happens if we go to this festival? Would the next festival then then um, still be, be um, able to, to select it and so on? Thank you very much. This also sounds like a lot of strategizing and good timing. We will come back to the question of timing a little bit later, but before we go there, Peter, do you want to go next? Yeah, of course, yeah. So I work for Tarskovsky Films. Uh, this is a company based in London, and we have two editorial lines, uh, which is basic. One is we are mostly known for uh, creative documentaries and uh, mostly uh, the winning films. Yeah, But on the other hand, we are working a lot with the broadcasters. So we sometimes work with the films which, which are uh, particularly maybe meant for the broadcasters yeah but also what we do um, mainly we do the sales of course and theatricals but uh, instead of sales well not only sales we do the distribution festival distribution and also uh, we do publicity sometimes we are also co-producers for the films and also we are running a VOD platform which is just uh, Taskovsky Films VOD platforms platform and also we are doing some training courses and programs that we started recently i think it's uh, usually focused on the production and how to bring i mean uh, some idea from the paper to the screen and some other which are mostly meant for the uh, young producers young filmmakers and uh, yeah 
And in speaking about yeah, my way and the uh, road to this work is uh, usually, well, I came mostly from the festivals side and I used to run in program festivals for 15 years. Some, some, uh, somehow there is something that you bring something like intuition into your life and work. And uh, it is about falling in love with the film. Sometimes it is something very subjective, but uh, mostly it is uh, something like uh, experience and knowledge. And uh, yeah, more or less, uh, this is yeah what mainly <laughs> this job yeah looks like. Thank you very much. I mean, your job title is acquisitions ex acquisitions executive. Sorry. And uh, what does that mean? And where do you find your acquisitions? And how do you look for them? Yeah. Well. There are two ways, yeah. Mostly, uh, one thing is through the pitching forums, and we follow the projects at the early stage. Also, we have a lot of people we used to work with, so we are in communi communication with most of the producers. Uh, in uh, well, for twenty years, this company is uh, is working around. So, uh, but uh, mainly, we enter at the first cut stage, and this is something that we sometimes prefer. And uh, yeah. And then we uh, find and think about the strategy, how to work with this film, where it's good to bring, and all what uh, one strategic thinking can be, <laughs> can make out the value out of the film. Thank you very much. We will later talk a little bit more about what it means to enter with a film or to get on board of a project, what this means in more practical terms. But now, last but not least, Alexander. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Sindicado and your work? Uh, yes, Marion, thank you. Yeah, my name is Alexander Govedaritsa. I'm running a Toronto-based sales and production company, uh, Sindicado Film Sales. Uh, we do also around 15 films per year. Uh, we executive produce one to two films per year and then get around 15 for sales. I mean, we're looking for like authorial, you know, cinematic, Films, you know, there's no really, there's no restrictions in terms of subject matter. Uh, some of the titles you might know, Taming the Garden, which I think is one of the biggest documentaries of last year. Um, you know, it was at Sundance Berlin, we had a woman captured, which was sold to 70 broadcasters around the world. Uh, it's also on Netflix, uh, you know, I mean, and we also do a little bit of fiction. Uh, Immaculat last year won Venice, uh, you know, Giornata degli Autori. And also the Future Line Award, and um, yeah, like we we do all right sales, so like you know we do full service, like you know we, st we like to come on board as early as possible. And the projects we like to produce, like from really from the you know from day one, from development, and the latest I would say is like just you know just before the world premiere, but we really avoid that, you know, because as, as Stefan said, uh, it's really hard to you know. You know, there's a lot, you know, like I think festival premieres are very important uh, and, and we like to choose the festival premiere, like the world premiere, like, you know, it, 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 it you know, it's, it's, I think it's key for, for like a theatrical film. I think it's really important. And then, you know, it's also important whether you premiere at the end of the year or the beginning of the year. I mean, there's really small details. Is it more a TV film or more, you know, like theatrical, you know, like, you know, and then, yeah, we like to premiere in the beginning of the year rather than at the end of the year and you know uh, so yeah like but yeah like most of the films we you know let's say you know like early production stage is going to become on board yeah thank you and i already mentioned what does it mean how do you come on board of a film and again like you you you, you alluded a little bit to it but where do you find these films and can also producers find you and how should they do that yeah, I mean, next week will be like six years since uh, I started uh, together with Greg Rubich, uh, Sindicato Film Sales. Uh, yeah, and it, it used to be like, yeah, more like, you know, you know, pitching forums, markets, uh, you know, uh, you know, like there's, you know, some connections I already established at the previous company I work with. And recently, I mean, like a lot of the filmmakers are coming back to us, you know, again, you know, Taming the Garden, uh, which is like a big hit, like, you know, it, it was also like a European Film Award nominee. Uh, like Salome Jashi, the director of her previous film, Blazing Light of Sunset, was one of our first acquisitions. You know, it, it actually was like the second film in our, in our lineup. 
and uh, you know it was very successful and and uh, you know like after a year we decided like we will work on her next film as well and you know uh, yeah right now it's a lot of you know like uh, filmmakers coming back to us but also yeah word of mouth uh, you know people just sending us uh, their films over email um, you know I think also but yeah like uh, yeah pitching forums are still you know even even though now it's online I mean it's still you know co-production market it's still where we meet new people and you know with the pandemic that's you know with that I can imagine it for newcomers into the industry, it's really challenging to meet new people. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, we still rely, even with the pandemic, yeah, we still rely on like, uh, you know, festivals mm. and, 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 you know, like, you know, we try to attend as many as possible, so, yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. I have a question for you along the similar, along similar lines, because obviously the pandemic has made it much more um, difficult and for all of us uh, in many, many different ways. And one of them is that most of the pitching forums And the places where you would usually meet people are taking place online, which means in particular for newcomers, this makes it much more difficult, as Alexander just mentioned, to um, get in touch or to network and to find new people. And at the same time, I do imagine that you have, uh, and you tell me now, a backlog of films obviously sitting also um, with you because of postponed uh, premieres and, 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 and what happened due to the pandemic. So what is your piece of advice for um, newcomers with projects? How can they be in touch with cats and dogs and how can they be in touch with you? And, and, and why and when should, when do you think is the best moment to be in touch with them? With I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy. Just send me an email. Our email contacts are on our website. Um, and actually I don't see the problem for newcomers to get in touch with sales agent as long as they know that we exist. And as a former student of film school, I realized that yeah. nobody told us about existing of sales agency. I have no, I, I had no idea that you know there is something like that. That who's dealing with this? You know who's selling the film to television and so on. So I think that's the main thing that actually should be a, a kind of addressed to film school that they should teach about us that there is somebody who's you know selling this film. And then there's quite a lot of websites that are you know having this kind of database of sales agencies. And then, of course, you should check, you know, each sales agency, each sales agency before contacting them, you know, to see if your film really fits their programming and what they're looking for. I'm, I mean, we are doing only documentary films, so obviously, if you have a short fiction, you won't address it to us. You will find somebody else. Um, and on what stage? It's um, as early as possible. I mean, it's better to do it earlier than later. Uh, usually we get on board on the rough cut stage. That's kind of the most common, I would say, for us. Uh, but of course, if you have projects in uh, in progress, development, production, you can go, um, go to, uh, get in touch with us, talk to us, and we can see if it's something that can you know, fit our catalog in the future. Uh, we can start conversation. We can you know start some kind of advising and you know talking about the about the project. Uh, but as somebody before said, like it's it's very difficult for us to get on board when the film was already released. We do it sometimes, it's a very rare case, but we do it sometimes after the premiere, for example, I don't know, on a big festival like Sundance, Berlinale, we can kind of try to, to you know, to continue it, but it's it's really much um, less comfortable situation than when we can start everything from the beginning, prepare strategy A, B, C for, you know, for the festivals and so on. So it's always better to do it earlier and uh, than too late, yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. And you, I think you mentioned something extremely, extremely important. The fact that many producers do not know that sales agents exist and also do not know how to engage with them. And I think there is also the tendency to, tendency to be confused between the work of a sales agent and the work of a distributor. Maybe, oh. Stefan, because I see you nodding, do you want to quickly, very briefly for, audio, for our audience, um, explain the difference between the two? And why, and also maybe at why it makes sense to get a sales agent in, on board as early as possible. The difference between a sales agent and a distributor is is pretty easy. A sales agent is working worldwide and basically working business on a business to business level. So we are we are um, taking the the rights from the producer. We are representing them, and we're we're selling parts of those rights to different. 
um, broadcasters to different people who execute these rights. That can be a broadcaster, that can be a theatrical distributor who makes a cinema release in, um, in their own country, that can be a VOD platform, you name it. The distributor is working like at the end of the line, um, is working like to the cinema, so um, basically owning the rights for a certain territory and then say, okay, um, let's put it into the cinema, so we book the film into the cinema and then people come to the cinema and, and, and pay an entrance fee. Um, so that's the, the basic difference. Um, why should you have a sales agent? Um, I think it's it's a it's a little bit of a bundling and, and streamlining because you would not be in a position um, as a producer to contact each and every broadcaster and to contact each and every distributor. Um, at the same time, if you are a buyer at a broadcaster, you just won't have the time to deal with each producer who, of course, like you know knows that his or her film is the best and most important one and have like half an hour to get a, an immense an intensive pitch on that film where you might know after after two minutes that it's not for the programming needs that you have as a sales agent we know of course these markets we know which broadcaster or which commissioning editor which buyer um, has what kind of program slot or which distributor goes for which kind of films in his or her, own kind or her um, a country. And that gives us the privilege to get more time and to get more, more um, attention from, from those when we kind of select, well, we have five new films and I think these three of those five could really be something for you. Um, so that's, I think that's the, the, the the most important thing apart from all those other um, aspects like saving time and maybe being able to negotiate better deals, knowing the deal terms and also including the legal fees. But um, I think this is this is the, the most important thing for me why I as a producer would always uh, choose a sales agent. Thank you very much. Um, anyone of you would like to add something to this before I move on? No hands up. Peter, we said several times, or you guys said several times, we come on board, we come on board. I will now come back to this. What does it mean? Where do you, let's say, let's say you are in a pitching forum, someone pitches, you really like their project, you have a one-on-one -on -one with them, and then what happens? Yeah, and then we usually meet and speak a lot about the project. First thing is uh, sometimes, uh, if we even love uh, the overall look, uh, sometimes it's very important for for example, for local stories, how to bring them to the international audience. And uh, with the pitching forums, it depends on the, is it early production of the film? Then we can work on this to help how uh, this story can be uh, more wide and more uh, attractive to international audience. And uh, yeah, this is something which is uh, yeah, very useful. And then it is, uh, well, we just uh, communicate, follow the project through the times and we, it's something like a marriage. We get, get into the marriage together with the producers and the author of the film and then uh, all the strategies are doing right on time. Uh, well, the most important part is after the, maybe when uh, most of the films enter at the first cut stage. And then we can discuss some of the things, yeah, about uh, what would be interesting to change Sometimes it is, uh, well, it's hard to discuss these things, especially with the authors, but some things are just, uh, uh, well, let's say uh, we have this experience in, in, in uh, what usually, uh, uh, what the industry demands are, for example, for the film. And then we just can suggest some things maybe to change. And yeah, but mostly this is a, yeah, something what we do and then yeah we have to always think about where to push the film and it's nice that alexander mentioned that it is really most important for the film where it starts its career and uh, then and where to hit the audience and uh, how important it is also the timing of the year is very very important yeah and these are all the things that we discuss uh, together with the producers and also very uh, yeah i also love to involve the directors and the uh, the whole authorship uh, authors crew in the in the process. Thank you, Alexander. Is this also the way you work with filmmakers? Uh, yes, I mean pretty much. I mean, you know, as I said, I mean we come on board as early as possible, and and uh, yeah, 
I mean, if you meet the, the, you know, the filmmakers in person, I mean, you know, if the question is like, you know, how we make decisions, uh, you know, I think it's pretty much uh, instincts uh, most of the time and, and, you know, how we communicate with, uh, with the filmmakers. Like, is there really a connection also with the, with the, with the, with the team? Because, you know, we're going to work with them for five, maybe 10 years. And then is that someone you want to, you know, to be in touch basically on a daily basis? And yeah, when it comes to the films, I mean, I mean, like, you know, people are always obsessed with, you know, like uh, subject matter and, and, and uh, you know, you know, what, what is selling, you know, and I think that's really the wrong approach. And, and you know, because I mean, and, and, you know, because I mean, in a way, like, you know, we have this uniformity in where like, especially in Eastern Europe, I think a lot of the projects look alike in a way and like, because they're trying to, to to copy a model like you know like you know this film was successful you know I'm gonna try to to to, to make something similar and usually I mean you know you can see through and if we can see through it like you know of course the broadcasters will see through it the whole industry will see through it so you know if I can give one advice and you know this is also what you're looking for is like autorial vision I mean really it comes down to that and and uh, also in terms of subject you know if you make a great film uh, that itself uh, opens up possibilities and then makes it uh, international, you know. But of course, we all, of course, I mean, there are subject matters that are like, you know, right now it's an environmental subject, you know, that it's like probably more in demand than everything else. But first and foremost, it needs to be a great film. Like with a woman captured, I think it's one of the biggest Eastern European documentaries of all times. And, and uh, you know, during production, they were really struggling. The, the team, Juliana Ogrin, the, the, the producer, but and it was editor, the, the director. You know, they were rejected by almost everyone. You know, you should make a short film. You know, do this and that. You know, they were really discouraged. And I mean, we came on board during early production. You know, like we said, okay, listen, uh, like just try to make the best film possible. You know, he is like a small MG. Uh, try to don't don't really like you know obsess. Like try to make the best film possible. It, it was her first feature. Then they went on to Doc Incubator, which is also like a great workshop. Uh, things happened, you know, the, 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 you know, like the, the project grew and then, and, and, you know, it ended up at ITFA main competition and also at Sundance for the North American premiere. And it really, it sold everywhere, like 70, 70 broadcasters from a project where like, you know, they barely managed to finance. I mean, the budget, like the film was really, I mean, the budget was much higher, but uh, they made the film like with like, you know, under 50,000, you know, which is like, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. So, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is maybe like a short answer, yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you also for uh, mentioning this particular film. I was about to ask you about it. So now you brought it up yourself. Before I will also ask um, this, you, you others to maybe take us through a little case study in a similar way that Alexander just did. I wanna ask you, Alexander, to, maybe, to give some background information on some very technical terms that you just mentioned. You mentioned MG and LOI. What is that? And in the context of sales, and yeah, how does it function? LOI, yeah. I mean, yeah, LOI is something that, uh, you know, filmmakers need, uh, you know, in order like to get support for the funds, you know, letter of interest. And, you know, frankly, uh, you know, I think it, it doesn't make much sense because, you know, everyone gets it. Like everyone can get an LOI, like, and, and then, you know, if everyone gets it, then, you know, like, I guess, you know, what is really the point? Uh, but uh, yeah, letter of interest. I mean, it's something we give out to to a couple of projects per year. We try not to overdo it. We get a lot of requests for that. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of like a letter of support that you know that project has some uh, international potential or that we are interested in it. Uh, and then on MG, on the other hand, it's uh, yeah, it's, min it's it's minimum guaranteed. It's something that you know it's kind of like a to you know token of appreciation and support for the you know, filmmaking team. I mean, it's, it can be like something very modest or it can be a higher MG for like, you know, projects executive produce. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, MGs is, you know, something we usually uh, give to the project because I mean, if you cannot commit to, you know, a certain sum, I mean, it, you know, then like, I mean, that, that you know, that that's the purpose of a sales agent, you know, to sell the film. And if, if there can't be like at least a small guarantee, I think there's, you know, like, uh, probably not much sense in, 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 in working with that sales agent in a way. I mean, especially if you're coming on board at an early stage. I mean, if it's 
if it's just before the world premiere, then I guess there's, you know, the film is already fully financed and there is no need for an MG. But like, if you're committing to be the sales uh, at an earlier stage, like I think that it makes sense to at least ask for like a minimum guarantee uh, or, you know, you know, at least discuss it, so. Yeah. Thank you very much. I would like to stay at this technical terms um, a little, for a little bit longer because how long how long does it usually take between let's say you gave an LOI for an inch for for um, a project and then you followed up on the project and you get on board of the project and when and how is the contractual work being done? Maybe Peter, in your case, well, it you depends. kind of sign the deal for a real commitment. Yeah, it depends, of course, on the production. I think uh, some uh, mechanics are working something in my building. <laughs> yeah, so maybe the sound will have some noise, but okay, that's life. Well, the situation it depends on the film. It depends on the stage of uh, when we enter. Usually, the LOE is in uh, late development at, or at some other point, and uh, it depends on the mostly on the relevance of the film because sometimes if it deals with the science or whatever, you have to trust that all these data is somehow real <laughs> in uh, this sense and uh, well but uh, about the time uh, it depends on the production more or less yeah but uh, uh, we usually when we find uh, when we sign the contract it is at the first cut stage or when we have something really to see about this and also maybe alexander didn't mention that with this uh, letter of support and let loi uh, the situation is that uh, it doesn't uh, oblige you. Maybe you will be the first to take a look at the film and then decide. Yeah, it is uh, like something that can be changed in the. Also, if we don't feel uh, like well with the producers, or yeah, we we do not get in. But it uh, always uh, mostly uh, it works like when we see the first cut and we uh, or the rough cut stage, then we can uh, somehow get the whole picture and and sign the contract with the film. Yeah. And this is how it mostly works. Thank you very much. Um, Alexandra and Stefan, just um, I'm going to stay on more uh, organizational and practical things for another moment. What would you describe as your role as the sales agents versus the producer's role? So what does the producer need to provide, let's say, for you to be able to do your job? Just a few pieces of advice and, and, and knowledge sharing. Maybe, Alexandra, you want to go first? I mean, uh, it's totally different job. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't do the same thing that producer is doing because we're getting on board actually when the film is finished. Um, and then we're presenting it, selling it uh, to, you know, all possible uh, in, uh, entities and like uh, trying to make this film alive after it's produced. Um, so our job is different. Of course, sometimes we are in conversation with producers at the earlier stage. We can advise them, for example, okay, we think that that would work more for international market, that would work less and so on, but it's more like advisor, um, uh, advisor board. We don't expect producer, for example, to listen to us totally if they want, yes. If not, it's, it's kind of their film. Um, and then what we, what we need from producers, where it's also pretty easy, um, we need uh, materials that we can sell to broadcasters and to, to distributors. So, for example, um, very often uh, producers already have read the DCP for festivals because that's usually what they're aiming for. And if there is a co-production with television, they usually have materials for their local television. And then it depends. Very often they have only feature version. Uh, of the film and we unfortunately always ask for TV cut. Um, this is uh, still the market that uh, television is paying the most and we always need a TV cut for the film. It's true that sometimes we can work with a feature version and it's um, we have maybe one film per year that exists only in a feature version but it's really limiting usually the amount of, of sales. So TV cut is something that we always expect from the producer. And um, if they didn't plan to have international agent, then maybe they don't have it in a the budget. They um, uh, they always, and they didn't, some, sometimes directors also don't want to cut their films in the shorter version because for them, it's kind of a crime uh, 
um, uh, over the over the over the film, but it's something that we unfortunately expect and need uh, for sales. Um, and then you know, like very simple things like uh, synopsis, uh, posters, some stills from the film, so we can promote the uh, the film to our uh, buyers, so we can do marketing of the film, some publicity, and so on. So this is kind of basics, I think. Usually, when we are starting producing, uh, sorry, co-production with the um, uh, collaboration with the uh, producer, they have those stuff ready anyway for their for their partner when they were producing the film. So those are kind of basics. Thank you, Alexandra. Stefan, would you like mm -hmm. to add to this? Yeah, just um, add quickly to the to the uh, famous or infamous TV hour. <laughs> Absolutely um, ag agree. Um, and I I often say to to filmmakers, don't see it as something that that limits your film or that that cuts your film into into um, pieces um, uh, that destroys your film. See it as something that that gives you an extra audience audience because on the on the TV market. 95% of the program slots are 52 minutes long or like one hour long. And um, if you don't have that possibility, you limit your, your options to having your film seen by 95%. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, one thing about, I, I need to, to, to think about your, your question first, like what is the difference between the producer and the sales agent? I thought that's, that's totally clear. And then it dawned on me because it both ha it has to do with financing. But I think in there is, is one of the biggest misunderstandings about producing. I, I um, have a tendency to say, um, as a producer, I'm much more than a bank. Financing the film is the most boring maybe not the most, most boring, can be very interesting, but it's the easiest part of making a film. Just getting the financing together. Um, and, and that doesn't, this, this should not sound arrogant in any kind of way. What I mean is there's so much more that you have to do as a producer making a film um, than, than getting the financing together. We can of course help much more on the side of Uh, refinancing of selling the film, sometimes also with with pre-sales on earlier stages, where where we can can maybe give some advice or or um, help with such things. Um, but uh, the 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 main things, of course, that we take care on a different kind of level and give advice in different kind of of ways. We're not taking um, uh, the, uh, the the work of a producer. That's something we we also cannot cannot handle. I mean, we um, that would be far too much. Um, I think that's the, the the most important thing to to um, take into consideration. When it comes to materials, that's often one of the most boring things, but something which um, everybody just should be aware of. Also, when budgeting, what what we need is like really class A material. It must be like technically according to the international broadcast standards. Think about if you want your film in cinemas that you have like the right sound mix. Think about that that um, some territories want to, to dub your film, so you need like stems, audio stems, in order to enable mixing um, in in different language versions and all these kind of things. Um, not mentioning the like the, the normal homework that every producer, of course, does, like clearing rights, clearing music rights, being aware that music rights need to be cleared worldwide for all media and all these things that sometimes get forgotten when you're kind of, you know, in the process of making a film or, or uh, making a low budget film. But that for us is just like a conditio sine qua non. We need this, otherwise we can't work. Thank you. So get you, Alexander. You had your hand. Briefly to add, like, like since you're in, like, talking about technical terms and deliveries, uh, I think, you know, I, I'm surprised that, you know, like a lot of uh, filmmakers, you know, you know, didn't start shooting in 4K, but it's already a standard. Like, so, you know, if, if you know, for any filmmakers out there, if you're starting a new project, uh, make sure it's in 4K because it's really like, there's many channels already that only do 4K. And uh, you know it's it's really it's really the standard. So full full HD is not really enough anymore. <laughs> so yeah. And as far as deliveries, I think stills are very underrated, like production stills, like very good production stills. Like you know we need like as many as possible, seven eight. And then the one that will really communicate with the, with the industry, and then you know like you know the flagship in a way still. I think it's very important. And also yeah, the one for the audience, like you know like the you know imagine a thumbnail on on, on Netflix. 
So think about the image that you want for that. So, you know, I think hire a good photographer during production. I think it's, you know, it's very underrated and, you know, we live in like very visual world and, you know, it's how do people make decisions, what they're going to, what they will watch. You know, I think it's very much based on like stills and, you know, it's thumbnails. So, yeah. Thank you. That's very important advice for all of the producers out there. Get your material in shape and good quality. I would like to use the last 10 minutes to ask Peter, Alexandra and Stefan to share possibly some examples of, film from, of films from Eastern Central Europe from their portfolio, maybe in a similar way that Alexander shared his um, little case study or insight into how he worked with a woman captured, um, if you could. And maybe I start with Peter because I'm sure you have many examples. Yeah, uh, well- Probably difficult to pick one even. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah, that is. But uh, first that comes to my mind uh, would be uh, this uh, Belarusian russian co-production. It is this film, uh, Where Are We Headed? Uh, which won uh, at the end two awards at uh, like best first film at ITVA and also the best cinematography at ITVA film festival. And it was like at first, uh, well, there is this thing that um, it was a, well, first film by, by a young director. What we were really stunned at the first was the visuals. I mean, visual part and cinematography of the film. And uh, we found this uh, like really huge potential. And on the other side, there was this thing about, well, the special look and view on the Russian society, which is important in a way, but uh, well, I don't know if it's uh, needed to be said, but uh, there is some trouble with the films coming from these parts. Yeah. And it is kind of obvious, yeah. And uh, somehow we had the same situation with some other titles uh, from these areas because Usually people expect some kind of story to come from this area. And uh, yeah, what this film bring was something totally different. And it was uh, really the film <laughs> first. And the information it was giving, it was more uh, to inspire and to open something behind than uh, really like to inform people on, okay, in, uh, there are these facts about life in Moscow, for example. But uh, this was, um, very nice, we chose the film and we worked, it works really well in all the territories. What I was really um, amazed was that uh, in United States, there is really huge interest about this film. Firstly, because it's a well-made film, but on the other, the way it deals with the information and inspires the audience, it is like something that communicates with the, with the audience. And I am now thinking that uh, half of the things that I would love to say I cannot announce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't think maybe I should uh, choose something yeah, before, but uh, some older title. But uh, yeah, this was this is something that uh, we found a very nice strategy how to work on this film and how to bring it, how to open the territories, different territories in different parts. Also, yeah, this is something. This is a film that uh, still doesn't have a TV cut because it is sometimes hard to make uh, this kind of thing with some films, because if you if it uh, deals with the facts, information, whatever, most of the films are like, you put out all the art parts, artistic, and you have information and you bring it to broadcasters. And that's how it works. But uh, yeah, with this, it's uh, something else that we still have to think about and then working together. I think what I like the most about listening to you talk about this project is the excitement that I can see in your eyes. So you really seem to really like the film, uh, which is great. <laughs> and I think this kind of also goes back to Alexander, what you were saying, that it's not about copying, copying successful films um, out there, but really kind of truly making the film that you want to make and then finding the right supporters and partners is also by um, taking them with you on this journey, um, but not copying what has been out there. So there's this big encouragement to continue making uh, good and different and new films and, and be courageous to, to do what you would like to be doing. Um, Alexandra, would you like to also share 
um, an example of that. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, in general, uh, Peter mentioned something that it's kind of sometimes difficult from uh, a film from uh, Eastern Europe. And it's true, like a few times I heard from my buyers that Eastern Europe is not sexy. So it's not, uh, you know, something that is easy to sell. But our recent um, very successful film was uh, The Earth is Blue as an Orange. Uh, it started in uh, Sundance and just after that it was in Berlinale. Um, luckily, it started before COVID. So even though, you know, it was, of course, harmed uh, pretty badly by, uh, uh, by, the, by the disease, it, it, it did amazingly well on festivals. And this is actually an example of the film that is not easy. And with the um, uh, proper festival strategy and proper festival life, uh, that is something that can really help with sales as well. Um, now uh, we are getting uh, interest in the film again, unfortunately, for all the reasons I would like not to have, because it's about war in Ukraine and we all see what's happening. So buyers are coming back to us with the film. Um, but it's uh, apart from the situation that is mentioned in the film, political situation is also a beautiful film, it's a beautiful family story. Uh, it's also a film about love for art and how can actually film can heal us uh, uh, in a way. Uh, so this is also like a, uh, example of film that is working on a, on a both on a both uh, sides um, and yeah it's 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 again you know like it, it wasn't something that uh, was maybe not done before but um, but it it is kind of unique film in a way um, so so yeah this is like I think uh, one of the best sellers for sure we have uh, from from East, from the territory not only from territory because the film works very well uh, internationally yeah Thank you for sharing this example. And while um, I hear you when you are saying it's difficult to sell stories from Eastern Central Europe, at the same time, all of the films that you have mentioned and many more that we have seen in recent years coming out of this, this, this territory has, have been extremely successful and, and very diverse. So, so in spite of the difficulties, um, there are so many incredible stories coming out of that territory, of course. Um, last but not least, Stefan. I totally agree with what was said, and I, I'd, I'd like to, to add, um, it really always comes, comes of not, not every story is the right story for everybody to sell to everybody. There might be films that, that you know, Alexandra might be perfect pitching to a broadcaster and I might not, and the other way around. It always has to do with how do you connect to a film? I mean, there's, there's one thing that we, we all assess in a, in a film in similar ways, like what is the potential and so on. But then there is this, this, this important um, uh, uh, piece of, of the gut feeling and your, your emotional connection. If I emotionally connect to a film, then I, of course, also can pitch it. And as you were asking for, for examples, um, I, I just think of like three very different films from different times. One is Holy Cow, a film that was a co-producer produced in 2015, which was this wonderful, amazing, unique story from Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani director Iman uh, Hasanov, um, who uh, basically uses this metaphor of um, here is somebody with a dream who, who dreams to have a cow in his village, which is not, not very um, unusual, but he wants a European cow, not a Caucasian cow, because it's bigger and gives more milk. And the village says, no, you're not bringing a foreigner to, to the village. So having this kind of metaphors in there make things sometimes like very, very charming also to pitch and everybody has a smile on his or her face when, when, when listening to that. Another film was Wall of Shadows by Lisa Kubanska. It's um, the, the third film that, that we've been um, selling of, of her work. Um, and um, that, that was just like this mountaineering story, which was an adventure. Um, and here it just helped that the film won I don't know, 25 festivals so far. And we have a full office of awards that were shipped to us and not yet back to, to Elisa still. Um, so sometimes it just like has this, this effect that, that people say, wow, it's an adventure story and I see something in there. Um, and that's what makes a film travel. Um, and the third one um, is Courage. Courage is technically not an Eastern European film because the production company is based in Germany, but it's an, a Belarusian director um, who, who made this wonderful film that premiered last year at, at Berlinale um, on the protests in, in Minsk. Um, and that was a film when, when, when we watched it, we were just like spellbound. Um, 
by the intimacy and proximity that Alexei Balyan had to the protagonists when filming them in, in the protests. And you can film protests in very different kind of ways. And you can only do that because he had already worked with the, the uh, protagonist for two, three years, and he had a, a local cinematographer and she did an amazing job by just like being there and being brave and so on. And even there, although the film had all the big festivals, it was not always easy to, um, to then take it to that TV level. Like for example, we, we, we sold it to, to Arte um, after Berlinale um, and we sat together with the, with the commissioning editors for quite a while uh, because they said, well, we love the film, but we need a bit more context for our audience. So we decided, we found a way together to edit 10 minutes out of the 90 minute piece. So it's 80 minutes now for an Arta version, which kind of gives a little bit of a, of a um, like closer to the penalty spot in the first uh, uh, 10 minutes. You know where you are, you have a bit more context. And then afterwards, the film is just like the same, just for a TV audience, it helps knowing where you are and why you're watching the film and you're not losing, losing people um, on the way, which doesn't happen if you're in a cinema, of course. But these are just like three very different examples mm. of, of films and, and how and why they maybe resonate then with an audience. Thank you so much, Stefan, and thank you so much, all of you. We have time for some closing remarks, if you have any. I, of course, would have one million more questions and I would like to stay with every single one of these projects and talk about them individually and also ask all of the questions of, about technical terms and and contractual obligations etc because i really really think that there is a need um, to understand a little bit better on of how things are being done but i think what we did in this last 45 or almost 50 minutes now it's already been super super great so thank you very very much um, for your generosity any closing remarks any comments that you would like to make and for the last two minutes that we have? No? Yeah. Alexander. Briefly, yeah. Go to your local cinema and I, I hope to see you all at the festival soon. I mean, that's that's all I can say. Oh yes, I can only second that. And, and look up all of the amazing different films that have been mentioned in the last five minutes and try to watch them. Um, you want to say something else, Alexander? I can see it. Me? No? no? Yeah, you look like you wanted to, you had something to add. No, 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 that, I think that's, you know. That's okay. it. Cinema All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so very much. Also, big thanks to Tomasz, who is the Zoom master in the background, and of course, to Hannah as well for bringing us all together. Thank you very, very much. And um, have a beautiful rest of the day wherever you are, and uh, hopefully I'll see you all soon in person again. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thanks for thanks. having us. Bye. 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 Bye.